What's up, gang? Welcome to The Greatness Machine. I'm your host, Darius from Shaz Day. I'm so pumped to have you here with me. Now, listen, The Greatness Machine, we're about two things. Number one, people who live in their passions. And number two, those who are creating greatness in the world and doing both of these things despite the odds against them. Each episode, we're going to feature interviews with game changers, business leaders, you know, telling us their origin stories, what made them tick, what got them to where they are now. Why? So it can help you step into your greatness within your life, your business, and your career. Occasionally, you might hear a few solo episodes from myself, moi, as I say, as I leverage my 20 years of entrepreneurship as a CEO and founder to help you grow and level up in your journey to scale your life and your business. So come be a fly on the wall, enjoy the conversation, and I'm stoked to have you here with me. Guys, welcome to today's episode of The Greatness Machine. I'm your host, Darius Machado. Boy, do we have a special guest. Trisha Walwork is in the house. What's up, Trisha? Just happy to be here. Thanks for having me. My gosh, I can't believe this happened. We've been we've been trying to schedule this for like a year. <laughs> it, wow. it finally happened. Um, do you mind if I do a little bit of housekeeping? We got a lot of new listeners to the show. I just want to like kind of get them up to speed. Does that work for you? Absolutely, yeah. Guys, so um, for listeners who are new to the show, The Greatness Machine, we're about two things. People are living their passions and those creating greatness in the world and doing so despite the odds. And Trisha is neither short of passion nor greatness. So um, I want to give a little bit, bit of background. I met Trisha through uh, Barbara, Barbara Yolis, um, who was my former CMO, and, and then Trisha's company, uh, Milo's Tea. We're going to be talking about uh, that in just a moment. She, you, You've been working with Barbara now for a little bit. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, that's so cool. So, so Barbara, um, how'd you go, how'd you meet Barbara, by the way? So we actually did, we had a beauty contest and did a search, uh, to find a new creative agency. And, um, it was just such a great fit, you know, in my experience with, with marketing, you know, we really know who we are as a brand and we just needed somebody to help us amplify that story. And she really, I mean, she and her team really just got us. So it, it, it's been really fun to work with the Ludwig group. That's so cool. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Barbara and, and, and Bill and the group over there, they're, they're, they're a bunch of badasses. Um, so, um, so yeah, so Barbara was telling me a uh, funny story. So Barbara was like, I think, I think she used me as a reference with you guys and, and you and I, you and I, you and I had a really good conversation about my experience of working with her at, and her group. Um, and they, they had built a advertising agency inside my company. And, um, it was funny. I was, um, there, I looked up the word, there's a thing called Bader. I'm probably mispronouncing it. It's called Bader Meinhof phenomenon, which is like, once something is on your radar, like on your reticular activating system, then all of a sudden you see it everywhere. So I, I'm from California. I've lived in Austin now for a few years. I'm not a sweet tea drinker. Um, so your company was not on my radar. Um, but I met you through Barbara and then all of a sudden everywhere I'm going, I'm seeing Milo's tea company. I, I swear, like I went and like, it, it was like within like three days of that, I saw it like five times. And so, um, so yeah, it was, I didn't realize you guys are, you guys are kind of a big deal in the world of sweet tea. I mean, the, the, this is like a, like a cult brand is what I've been told. Um, so it, it was really funny to see that. Um, but if you don't mind, what I'd love to, if you could do is maybe give our listeners uh, a little bit of your origin story. I know that the, the, of the company, you yourself, you're the chair and CEO of Milo's Tea Company. And so uh, there's going to be some listeners that are going to be huge fans of, of your product. But for those uh, listeners who don't necessarily know your product, I'd love if you can maybe give a little bit of background about yourself and, and the business and, 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 you know, some of the origin story, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Be, uh, delighted to share. So, so I always say we're a 78 year old startup um, because we run the business that way. But uh, we actually were founded in 1946 by my granddad. Milo was actually a person, Milo and my grandmother B. And um, his concept was really simple. Uh, open uh, a restaurant on the north side of Birmingham, Alabama, is where all the factories were. Weren't open for breakfast. They weren't open for dinner. They served lunch and, and quick serve food. And it was like a decade before McDonald's. So it was a really inventive idea. Um, and they lived their, their passion, their whole lives, raised two, raised two sons and, um, really didn't have aspirations besides having that one restaurant. Uh, my parents, and, you know, that generation said, well, this is a really great concept and started franchising the restaurants. And they noticed people would drive through just to get the tea because there was only in the grocery store, what I call the chemistry experiment in the can, you know, it's like not real tea. It's just a bunch of chemicals. So they started selling tea in the grocery store in the late eighties. And um, I never thought I'd join the family business. I was a vegetarian and my parents owned hamburger restaurants. So um, I went and became a lawyer and practiced law for, for a few years, but quickly realized I was just way too entrepreneurial to do that. Um, the culture in the law firms weren't ready for me. Um, 
So I left and actually joined the business as a general counsel. My dad had hired a guy to run it and had sold the restaurants in the, in the meantime. And uh, so I worked for this guy for a few years. And then I went to the family about 10 years ago and said, you know what? I want to run this or else I'm going to go teach yoga or do something else. You know, I think we've got we've got a tiger by the tail. And since then, we have had our foot on the gas. We have become the number one refrigerated tea in America. We're the fastest growing lemonade. And we do it all because we have loyal fans who I mean, our loyalty is unheard of in CPG. So, um, you know, it really is remarkable. The story, the growth story. You see it a lot, Darius, you know, you, these forward looking decks where people come to you and they've got this hockey stick of growth, you know, well, that's what we've done. And um, the crazy thing is there's still so much opportunity, like with our core, with adjacent SKUs, with um, just continued development of the brand. Um, there's just so much white space for us ahead. So um, it, it really is an extra sweet growth story. I love that. So, so. I want to back up. So your grandfather and grandmother started a, a, a like a, a like a hamburger stand. Like is that correct? Is that what right. you're saying? Restaurant. And That's so, right. how, so so and 78 years ago. So what is it? It's 2024. So we're talking like in the 1950s. Is that, no, is that 1946. correct? 1946. 1946. Wow. So this is right. Yeah. This is like literally like right around the time World, World War II ended. Right. So this is right at the end of World War II. That's crazy. So. So what did, was he in like the war and came back from the war and started the, this business? Is that correct? That's exactly right. He was he was in uh, the Pacific Theater during World War II. He came back. Uh, he always said he had twenty dollars and a foot locker and he married my grandmother the next week. And, um, you know, they lived his his dream to open this restaurant. If if you saw pictures of it, okay, y'all, it was it was a walk up restaurant because my granddad said because um, back then in Birmingham, Alabama, not everybody could sit together inside a restaurant, and he said if everybody can't sit together, then nobody's going to sit, and so they you just walked up and got your food, and then you had to go, um, and uh, you know that that principle still guides our company today as we think about, you know, treating everyone uh, with dignity, and respect, and um, it's a wonderful foundation on which, you know, our values are based. How, how, how big did, he, did they grow the restaurant to? I mean, it's, uh, again, you said this is like pre McDonald's. So it's post World War Two, he starts a hamburger stand. I love the, 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 the just the, the way that there was already core values baked into the business early on, but how big did this business grow to by the time? I mean, you know, you and I are like, I think similar in age. Um, and you know, when you were growing up, was this like a, like a, a all over the place restaurant or were there a few locations? Like how big was Milo's from a restaurant perspective? So Milo um, and my grandmother just had the one restaurant and my, my parents actually were the ones that started franchising it in the eighties. And um, they're probably there were really only locations in the Al in Alabama. They they opened franchises in Texas as well as Florida for whatever reason. The brand didn't travel, or there were you know not good franchisees or bad locations or whatever. Um, and I think when my dad sold the restaurants, there were probably which was uh, in two thousand and two, there were probably fourteen or fifteen restaurants. And and it's the kind of food that you either you really like it, you know, it's a burger with with like a sauce on it, um, or it's not your thing. So it uh it really the you know, the tea company that that grew out of that uh really is is so much larger, obviously. You know, we're in almost fifty thousand retail locations across America and um continuing to add every day. And so, so with the, the tea, when did they start selling the tea outside of the restaurant? What, what year did that happen? So that was in the late eighties. And, um, right. And that was, it was such great luck. That was about the same time that the largest retailer in the world, Walmart started, um, their super centers. So before that they were just general merchants and Walmart's entry into grocery really changed grocery. You know, if you really look at the industry back then, it was regional, kind of a regional patchwork of uh, grocers. You know, if you grew up in California, you probably remember the place where you shopped. And, you know, now I guess Kroger and Albertsons have probably gobbled up a lot of those. And, you know, they're obvious, like in all industries, there's massive consolidation. Um, but it really did change you know, their philosophy of uh, everyday low prices, as opposed to a lot of grocery retailers whose philosophy is, high low where, where, you know, they're always going to have things on feature and train the shopper to, um, 
to look for the sale as opposed to, you know, offer everyday low prices. And so when they opened a super center in Birmingham, they did the research and said, what do we need to have? And they knew it was Milo's, you know, we were, the brand was very uh, loved locally. And uh, that, that really opened a lot of doors to just have, you know, we've been doing business with them for over you know, 30 years now. And um, so really good timing for, for my parents to, to have that opportunity. What year, so what year did you get involved um, at, with the tea company? So I joined the company in 2004. And uh, like I said, I, you know, it was very small. When I joined the company, we sold about a million cases a year. And today we produce that in a day. Um, so wow. we had like, yeah, it was, I feel like a founder, right? I mean, we may be a third generation family business, but when I joined, you know, we were really only sold locally and I had the chance to go ride on route trucks and get in the plants and really learn, you know, uh, how our quality system and write a lot of the system. So, I mean, I, I grew up with the business. Um, I have been the CEO and chair since 2012 and, um, we became the number one refrigerated tea in America in 2021. Wow. And so um, when you start looking back at, you know, 2000, you said, I think you said 2004 was when you joined. Um, how big was like, how big was the organization? I, 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 for a person like me that doesn't know what a million, a, a million cases a year sounds like a lot to someone, the unknowing eye compared to 365 million cases a year. Um, like how big, how many, people worked at the organization when you first joined? Uh, we had teens, probably teens when I first joined. And today we have uh, over 800 associates. Wow. Okay. So, yeah. so you're, you're in the teens, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, you know, a couple dozen people maybe. Um, and, and, and you're starting the business, you're getting in there, you're on the ground floor. It's something, right? It's, it's not nothing, but it is, it's a business, but it's a relatively small business. Um, and if, if to your point, if you go back 20 years ago, when you joined the organization, um, there was still a fairly fragmented consolidation of grocery at that time, right? Like, like, it's very right. different. And, and even from a consumer brand CPG, then, um, I have a friend who had a CPG company and, you know, we started thinking of talking about, they started theirs in like the, I think 2010 ish. And, um, you start to look at these, like, what's the, what's the word I would look for? It's kind of like incumbent brands, right? Like having a random brand 20 years ago, you didn't get a lot of attention. If you were compared to like, uh, I'm going to use tea. I don't know anything about tea, but I'm going to use the tea that I know. It's like Snapple, right? Like, it's like, okay, Snapple, Arizona iced tea. Um, I, I can't really name any others, right? Like I just named the two teas that people probably drank a lot of back then, right? And then right. there's, and you guys were much more of a regional play, it sounds like. Um, how did you go from, like, what was the, was it intentional? Was it like by chance? Was it just like kind of this like slow growth to it became so inescapable that you couldn't help become national? Tell us how you went from this regional brand to a national brand. I'd love to hear that story. Yeah, well, you know, it's a complex puzzle, of course, but as we continue to grow outside of our region, we were, when I joined the company, we were distributed in dairy crates. And so we built the business locally uh, through dairy distribution. We had DSD trucks where we direct store distribution, where we would go out and deliver directly to the stores. Uh, we made, we took the big risk to kind of divorce that uh, go-to-market strategy and invest in putting it in a box, uh, a, a corrugate box, so that we could go directly to warehouses. And that allowed us to go and own the relationship with the customer before our dairy partners owned the relationship because they were bringing it in their dairy truck. And so, you know, transforming that supply chain really allowed us to show what we are good at. And we, you know, we, we exist to deliver Milo's moments. Um, that is our core purpose. And you know, there's four different uh, pillars to that. And one is the customer. And in our world, exceptional execution is critical. And for a small company like, like Milo's at the time, um, that was critical to show that we weren't going to do we were only going to deliver what we said we could deliver. We were going to deliver on time, in full, the the items that their shopper wanted. And because, you know, unlike other categories in the grocery store, like if you're going to buy, you know, um, 
taco seasoning mix, you might, you're not buying that every week. You know, you may only have taco night, you know, every couple times a year, but our fans that are shopping the category, this is part of their lives. I mean, we're at their dinner table. And so the amount of turns and velocity we can bring to the, to the refrigerated case um, is, is really remarkable. So I would say the most critical thing is over delivering. I mean, truly having that exceptional customer service and then being willing to say no. Um, I will say that we also, so we're a certified woman owned business and we did leverage that to get opportunities that, um, because to your point, a buyer wants a national program. Well, we couldn't do a national program back then, right? And we didn't have the resources. And so it is, it's more work for them to, to have these regional, you know, brands. And so having the opportunity to network with these major retailers, not just with your buyer, but with other executives or people in other parts of the company that helps you navigate these machines, understand the language that they have, um, and really help accelerate your growth. Had, it was truly, um, uh, rocket fuel for us. So, um, you know, I, I would encourage any of your listeners that, that are in those positions that are considering, you know, in, in any business, I mean, today, supplier diversity, um, and, you know, groups can be truly helpful to, uh, you know, unstick you with key counts. Nice. So, so uh, I want to go back. So when you start in the business, what was your, what was your role then? I mean, obviously you became the CEO, but what was your like initial job? I was the vice president and general counsel. Got it. So, That's right. so, lawyer. Um, so you're yeah. a trained, a trained attorney, a recovering attorney. Um, recovering. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, where did you go? Where did you do law school at? Did you go? You went I to went law to school. Alabama, the University uh, of Alabama School of Law. Did, and where did you do your undergrad at? At that other school in Alabama. Auburn. Oh, you went to Auburn. <laughs> <laughs> yes. it, that's like sacrilegious isn't it like that's like anti like in alabama are you even allowed to go to both those schools <laughs> it's 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 telling a religion here yes yeah <laughs> i didn't even know that was legal in alabama <laughs> um so so you went to auburn and then you then you then you flipped on your your fellow auburn folks and, and went to uh roll tide um and so uh how long were you an attorney for I practiced, uh, so I worked at the federal appellate court uh, for a year, which is a which is a very uh, hard job to get out of law school for a man uh, named Judge Anderson. He was the chief judge of the Eleventh Circuit Court of Appeals, so that represents Florida, Georgia, and Alabama. And um, it was a really it, he was probably my best boss. I mean, he had such pride in the rule of law. He was the chief judge at the time, and. I'll never forget. He walked in, you know, the first day, and these are all most of the kids go to not schools like Alabama. They go to schools up in New England and these fancy schools. And you know, uh, he walked in. He said, you know, y'all are all, you know, top of this and all of that. But I want you to understand that every single one of these cases matter. Every single one of these, you know, even if it seems small to you, and just the pride that he took um, in in people and caring um, was just it was true. And the trust that he placed in his clerks. So. Our job was to write the, uh, a draft of an opinion, and then he decided, you know, I like it or I don't like it and, you know, would revise it or whatever. And to be 24 years old and have that amount of trust by somebody that was so accomplished, you know, is truly was just it was really meaningful to me as a young, uh, you know, professional. And the cool thing. OK, so this was in uh, 2000. And guess what? That was the Bush v. Gore case. And then he was mm -hmm. the chief. So it came out of Florida. And so we got to write the en banc opinion, which means it was the full court. You know, it wasn't just a three panel uh, judges. Now, the, the Supreme Court ended up deciding it ultimately, but it was very exciting time to be in chambers. You'd pick up the phone and this justice's office was calling and this justice's office was calling. So it was it was very um, it was very exciting. Yeah, that, that was I mean, most listeners who, who aren't or are not over the age of 40 will not be able to appreciate what you just said. So that was, that was like a highly contest. There was a massive like a contest. I mean, obviously we just had the thing with Trump, but which was a t totally different cup of tea, but, um, but yeah, that was a big deal that the, 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 what was it? The chads, right? The hanging, the hanging chads. chads, the hanging yep. chads. <laughs> I know I, I, I was a white house intern in 2000. So, so I was, I was, uh, I was uh, for Clinton. Um, which was interesting because I'm from California and I, and I went and worked at the white house and, um, 
And I never met so many people from Little Rock, Arkansas in my whole life. <laughs> like half half the place was filled with people from Little Rock. So so that but, but anyway, that came right after that because that was the summer two thousand, and then in the fall was when the, the the whole debate about what happened in Florida happened. So that's crazy. So you did that, and then uh, did you work for a law firm after that? I did. I worked for a law firm here here in Birmingham. Uh, in the in the interim, I had gotten engaged to my husband, and he had cheaper uh, grad school opportunities in this area. I had accepted a job to go to a larger law firm in Atlanta. And then we just ultimately decided we didn't want to live in Atlanta. So, um, you know, practicing law uh, was, I learned so much. It was a wonderful crash course um, just to see so many different businesses and what they did well and what they didn't do well. Cause I was in litigation. So, you know, it was always, there was always a problem. Um, but you also, as a young lawyer, they'll, they'll put you into different groups. So, you know, they, they had me cycle and do some, a little bit of work in labor and employment, a little bit of work in bankruptcy, you know, so you got to see, you got to see so much and, and, you know, you can learn from everything, every experience that you have. So having a chance to kind of peek into these enterprises, I think really helped position me as I, you know, have moved through my career. So, so when you, when you came to the family business, when you got there, was it like, Hey, we're going to grow this to a national brand or was it just like, Hey, I want to, I'm, I'm interested in this. Like, what was your, like, what was the motivation to go from, obviously you went to law school, you worked in law, you worked for the courts and then you worked for a law firm. And it's like, Hey, I think I want to do this over here. Was there, was there a need for that? Was the, what, or what, what, what got, what was like the introduction for you to say, I want to go do that over there? You know, I was just, well, uh, you know, my parents had started succession planning and had given uh, some of the business to my sister and I. And so I, I really wanted to come learn it. I mean, I'm just, I, I'm, my purpose and my why really is find a better way. So, you know, how, how can I go learn about this? I believed in, you know, what we did. When you work with a family business, it's founded on love, right? I mean, the idea that we could really build a business that that continued to propound those those that those values of taking care of others of um, stewardship to the planet to one another and then delivering deliciousness. I mean, our fans give me so much purpose. Um, they love our product. You know, we become a part of their lives. So, you know, it's not the the show pony. It's really the plow horse, and that's really what I've been doing. You know the past 20 years, but particularly the last 10, you know, and as the CEO is head down, grow this business. There really is no stopping where we can go and what we can do because, you know, it's my goal for this to be a generational uh, business. I mean, my own children, I, you know, we're working really hard to get them. Uh, maybe they don't work with the business, but be responsible shareholders one day and, and um, understand, you know, what our core values are as a family and um, what, you know, keep going. Right. I mean, I want to do that. That's always been what I've wanted to do. I don't know early on. Well, I, I can tell you with certainty I, early on. I don't think I, I dreamed that it would, it would accelerate in the fashion that it did. Um, and I attribute that to being true to our values, right? Um, just the honest relationships that we have being scrappy, you know, uh, being authentic and who we, who we are as a company and how we behave with one another internally being authentic externally to our fans and to, you know, in our, even in our product, you know, having real ingredients. There isn't anything in our product that you don't have in your kitchen. Um, and it's not the easy way to do it, but it's the right way to do it to deliver the delicious taste that our consumers are synonymous with Milo. So it's very fun. Yeah, that's, that's so cool. So, so when, when you got there and obviously I'd love to hear about what was it a thing where, when you're selling, obviously you're selling a million cases a year. That's that's nothing to sneeze at. It's a, it's a real business at that point. Um, it came out of this restaurant that your grandfather had started. But um, I have a question. So was it like a cult following at that point? Or was it just like a cool product that you guys had? Like how would you have characterized the business at that size? It we it was the same exact loyal fans that were, that were shopping at Milo's, right? Um, we've just been able to to grow that fan base nationally. So, um, you know, consumers over the last 10 years have been looking for alternatives to carbonated soft drinks, to other beverages that they, you know, that are not healthy for them. And so like California, so we went to Cal, we started selling our product in California in 2014. The consumer development index for tea in a ref refrigerated tea in California at that time was uh, single digits. Okay. 
But over the course of the last decade, because Milo's is there and we've created excitement in the category, then we have got now the consumer development index is, is uh, about 50. So consumers are coming to the category because we finally have a product that's real. In, in the tea category in particular, consumers have been lied to. They bought this drink that says tea on it and it doesn't taste like the tea that they grew up drinking or it doesn't taste real. Um, so as we gain trial, as we grow awareness, um, we're creating excitement in the category. And guess what? Our customer really likes that because when you're growing the, you know, they don't really care if, if brands are, they're still a share from each other. And that doesn't do anything for the, for the, you know, the category. But if you're creating excitement in the category, then you truly are a category leader. Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, <clears throat> so I love that. It's it's like really just product first, making a great product. I mean, I grew up my folks making, you know, sun tea, right, in the backyard and like like that was that was the tea we drink. My wife still makes tea at home. But um and I'm Persian, which means tea is like a big deal. Like people drink hot tea like 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 the it's like like their water essentially. So I grew up kind of drinking tea in a, in an interesting way. Um but I'm I'm curious that was there a point where like I mean, obviously you J curved the business. Um, you became the CEO and you said 2012, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Right. So you're eight years into the business. Was it, I mean, there, I'm, it sounded like there was another CEO. What, were they not getting it done? Or were you like, no, they're doing a pretty good job, but are they still there? Like what happened with, how, how did that work? Cause I would assume that was not like a, yes, please take my job moment. Well, uh, you know, the, the guy was operating as a de facto president, but his title was actually COO. And um, so he did decide to uh, leave the business. Um, and, you know, here's, here's the hard, the hard, I would say the hardest thing. When you are 10x in the business over and over again, every time you double, you break your people and you break your process. Yep. Right. And so it takes very, it takes unicorns that can 10x themselves to keep up with the pace of a business like Milo's. Um, so I'm, I read like my life depends on it. I listen to podcasts like my, you know, life depends on it because I can't live long enough to make the mistakes. I have to learn from the wisdom and the experiences of, of others. And so, you know, when I look at workforce development, when I look at our org design, you know, the thing that will hold us back is not having the right people in the right seats at the right moment that are ready. And just being super relentless about that and, and making sure we're just really honest with our teams and, you know, our, our leadership team in particular um, and really providing those pathways so that they can keep connecting themselves, finding those unicorns. Five years ago, I, it would be really hard for me to recruit high, high level CPG talent, you know, that I have said, you got to come live in Birmingham, Alabama. They're like, no, 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 it's Chicago or, you know, LA or, you know, but now we've done such an exceptional job building our employer brand um, and really, you know, building out the business. Obviously, I mean, it's a much different proposition to take, you know, a, a risk when we were, you know, a third the size than it is, you know, where we are now. Um, so that's really helped um, the talent that we have been able to attract. And I will say, yeah, it's because they, they you know, people people want a purpose-driven enterprise, right? They want to work somewhere that, that they know cares about them. Um, but I, the thing that I hear most is it really is this culture piece, you know, that, you know, these are folks that could go work at the, you know, this private equity and then go flip that and get that and do this. But they're at the point in their careers where they want the purpose-driven piece and, you um, you know, we deliver on that. We do behavioral assessments as part of our onboarding and like recruiting. And um, so I talk to our industrial psychologists all the time, you know, how we doing, or, you know, whatever. Anyway, um, and one of the biggest compliments that I think we've ever got, you know, he's given is that all these people, you know, because he talks to them pre-employment and then he talks to them at the end of their 90 days. And all these people at the end of their 90 days are like, this isn't just a sign on the break room wall. This is real. You know, it really is a people first company and I feel it and I'm excited to be here. And so that gives me a lot of, um, that fuels me that we can continue that, you know, even as we grow. Yeah. Look, I'm, you're, 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 I'm probably one of the few podcast hosts that you're going to talk to that has actually built a company from 13 employees to a thousand employees. So I, I hear you. And, and I think that it's what you've done. People may, you don't really understand the magnitude of what you just said unless you've done it. I think, I think people look at it and they're like, I don't even know what that means, but I literally know exactly what you just said. Cause I did it. Um, it's yeah. tough. It's hard. 
uh, you, when you said you break your people, when you you know double the size of the business, a lot of people can't move at that pace. Um, I found it, it was really painful for this a lot of my executives who were there earlier on, but as they doubled, they didn't they they couldn't kind of keep up with the pace of the growth and they couldn't hold on to their positions. How have you handled that? Because I know for yeah. us, it was there was a lot of pain around that. I mean, I, I worked through it, but it, like people just didn't make it. It ruined some relationships from my perspective. Um, I had to replace folks. Well, how have you How have you managed through that as a CEO? You know, it, it's it's one of the it is the most challenging part of, of a, a super high growth business, right? Um, and the only way you can manage is like everything else. I mean, being truly honest about the capabilities that are needed for success. Um, having a culture of high trust, but also high accountability and um, just being absolutely just unapologetically honest about what needs to, um, what we need to do together and um, also investing in them. You know, if, if, if somebody's struggling and you surround, you halo them with people that are ahead of them, um, they can, they can, a lot of times they can catch up. Um, we have done and, and had a lot of success in areas where you allow them to job craft. So, you know, we go, okay, what, this is not a great fit right now. Let's look over here. These are the things that you're really good at. You know, er, do you have the ego to be able to go over to this other role? And sometimes the people do, and sometimes people make a different decision. Um, but it is, it is exceptionally difficult. And what I've found, you know, made, I've made so many mistakes, you know, um, <laughs> But now I, I, I try I, I try to hire somebody that's what I need five years from now, right? Yeah, and, yep. and and so that that's and it's hard to imagine what you need five years from now because we're going to double the business again and then again. So um, you you really have to be um, way out in front of it. And yeah, I think what what you just said is really important. Um, and so for listeners, if you didn't pick up on it, is that as you start to build the company you're you're not in like as a ceo or as an entrepreneur like you're not living in today's world you're living in in i used to joke that and this is my business i left my business uh in 2020 but probably last time i said this was in 2019 i said look for you all it's 2019 for me it's 2023 and and i'm and i'm reverse engineering where, where what needs to happen over the next four years for that to, for where i'm envisioning the business four years from now um so when you start thinking of milo's and it's you know now 2024 and you're you know <clears throat> leaning into the future as one of my mentors would say leaning into the future is 2028 or 2029 what are you what are you doing like what is what does the brand look like by then so it's our goal to be in a fourth of the households in America um currently our household penetration is uh you know right around 10 so that's a lot of growth right that is a lot of new consumers that we uh we we plan to bring on. And so to do that, you know, not, not everybody's shopping the iced tea category, right? You said that earlier that you're, you know, you and your family aren't currently shopping it. So, you know, how, how do we get in y'all's refrigerator? What, what, what beverages do we need to, to, to um, lean into? Um, we also are going, we want to be known as one of the most trusted brands in America. Um, to do that, we believe that we need to really lean in on our commitments around people and plan it. Um, we are a certified zero waste company, so that means we don't produce waste in our manufacturing and we reuse or recycle 98% of that. Last year alone, that was 72 um, million pounds of waste that we diverted from the landfill. And so we're going to keep doing that. And um, we, we're going to keep doubling down on the people first commitment because at the core of everything we do, you know, we just t talked a lot about people great people can sell a mediocre product, right? They can win with a mediocre product. So if we continue to invest in this unique people first culture, we believe that that will, that will fuel the flywheel that will allow us to continue making delicious um, products, maybe not even just beverages. And then that will uh, create loyal fans and that will fuel the growth and that will allow more people first behaviors. And so, I mean, that's our flywheel. And um it, it's it's work to get us here and we know that it will continue to get us there if we can really double down on who we are and not stray away from it. You know, every time we've tried to stray away from it, we launched a, a new brand in a shelf stable category that was, uh, but it had some preservatives in it. So we launched it under a different brand name. It wasn't successful. And as I look back at that and I go, what, what, what happened? We got away from who we are. We didn't yeah. use real ingredients. 
right? So we know who we are. We just we just keep keep compounding as long as we're disciplined around that. Yeah, I love that. I think I think you're making a really good point, which is you know just just kind of keeping it simple, right, and staying true to who you are. I, I have a question on that actually. And so I've uh, I mentioned I have a friend who had a CPG brand. It was the name of the company is Dang Foods, and so they would do like these like I don't know if you know the product or not, but um, they're po- they're a popular like Asian snack food company, and they're in the whole, all the Whole Foods and a bunch of other places. Um, and so he got interviewed by Guy Raz for how I think how this was built. Uh, that yes. that part, him and his brother got got interviewed by Guy twice actually, um, and they came up. They were talking about this concept of share of stomach. I've never even heard of it before because I'm not a CPG person. Um, and so when you start, so so here I'm gonna I'm gonna regurgitate my understanding of share of stomach. I'm sure this is not a new term in your world, um, but it's really like how much of like my stomach do I let a product or a set of products, you know, when I start thinking of the products I consume, because I'm, I think in this probably the same for most people is we kind of become creatures of habit. We eat the same stuff or drink the same stuff consistently. We go buy the same products when we go in the store and, you know, you kind of get into a habit or a rhythm around that and introducing a new product is probably like less, the older you get or the longer you get st- into a rhythm with the product set, the less likely I am to introduce a new product. The more I trust a product, the more likely I am to maybe try a different product they have because I like their product set. Um, so when you start thinking of Milo's and share of stomach, how do you think of, how do you guys approach that strategically in your business? Yeah, well, I mean, we, everything in CPG starts with the consumer, everything. So, you know, we, we, we do a tons of insight and research about the consumer. We know who the consumer of today is. We know our aspirational consumer. And then when we look at adjacent categories or product development, it's always about the consumer. What is he or she doing? And um, how, you know, how can you serve their needs? And at the end of the day, that that is always where you go um, to, to suss out opportunities. And, um, you know, if we can serve the consumer and our aspirational consumer, uh, and serve their needs in in a way that's consistent with our brand equity and our values and who we are. Then, um, and you got the right people, you know, executing these these innovation or you know um, new categories. Then they're really and you have the trust, like you said, right? If you, you so if you saw Milo's in an adjacent category and you trusted our brand, you go, oh, this stuff's good. I trust these people. Then you're going to try it. Um, one example, so so we launched Lemonade actually in 2014 um, and really to position, to begin the journey of, we're, you know, we're not just a tea company, we're a beverage brand. And we didn't do any marketing. We just put it on the shelf. We launched it only just in our core market, you know, Alabama, Tennessee. And um, we gained trial immediately for the exact reason you just said. People trusted Milo's and they they like Lemonade too. They said, let's try their Lemonade. And then they were loyal fans. Um so that is exactly, you know, how, how we can do it. What do you think? Um, I'm, I'm finishing. So I, I got, I, I'm a big reader. I think you and I talked a little bit about this when we first spoke and la- I finished, I read 52 books last year. Um, I'm, I'm, this year I changed my goal. Cause I, I realized when you set a goal of 52 books that you end up kind of, you're like, oh, I can't read that book. It's too long. Cause I won't hit my number. So, so I lowered my number to 30 and I was like, Hey, I'm going to read some longer books. So I'm finishing Steve Jobs book by Walter Isaacson right now. And you know, he, Steve Jobs, obviously a, a, a pretty big name in the world of consumer products. He's a, you know, kind of a, a genius one, one could argue, you know, he has a, a position that consumers don't know what they want. How do you guys think about that? Well, it's a really good, really good point. So our, you know, we do a, a ton of work like uh, where we, we would have focus groups with consumers because it's that whole, you ask why, and then you ask why again, and then you ask why again, because you are exactly right. If I said, what what claims would cause you to pick up my beverage? Um, and, and this is a great example. Our, our, our research that we pay all this money for and you have focus groups around says that, when we have family owned on our packaging, that isn't uh, something that our consumers care about. But the reality is I know that they do. And um, so that's one where you just throw the research out the window because family owned tells you that concept that we talked about earlier, it's love. And, and you're going to trust a brand pr- uh, more if you know it comes from a family business um, than some big corporation. Uh, and so even though those things don't suss out in our research, you know, some of it's gut. Yeah. 
That's a, that's interesting. It's, it's, it's actually a good point. Like I was just thinking when as you were saying that, I'm like, I'm like, I trust brands more if they're family owned, especially if it's 78 years, right? Like that, those two things say say things, right? And now, if it was a, a, the exact same product and one was like you know not family owned and I didn't know how long they're around, like I'd probably buy the one that was around for almost you know. 80 years <laughs> like that was owned by family. Cause it says, it says some, tr- there's some trust markers there that you can't argue. Right. Um, right. so that, that's a good point. Um, so what, when you start to think about, um, you know, you know, being a people centric business, um, and how you can lean into your folks to continue to, I guess, be, continue to be fit, raving fans because I mean, my perspective on this, and I'm sure you're going to agree is that, you know, Mercedes has a concept that you might've heard of, which is customer one, right? Which is I'm, my internal customer, their experience will become a reflection of my external customer's experience. If I show love and I create a, 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 a culture of love within my business, then my folks are just going to like, they're going to try harder. They're going to, they're going to make sure that, that, that they're going to have pride around the product they're creating because they know they love their job. And if they love their job, then they're going to, this can be reflected in their work. Um, so I just had that approach when I was CEO. And when I counsel uh, or advise CEOs, I'm like, Hey, look, you can't pay people to care like long-term. I can, I can pay people to care short-term, you know, for like a project, you know, if I pay them enough, but, but, but I really truly can't pay them to care long-term. So when, when you start thinking of, or when you say we build a people centric or a core value driven organization, and I always encourage folks to buy my book because I, I mapped out how I did it. Um, the core value equation, what do you like? How do you do that? What's your approach? Do you guys have a philosophy, a strategy? Like, how? What is the your system for building that at Milo's? So it is something that I spend a lot of time on. You know, as the CEO, I own culture and I own strategy, and and um, so you know, back I I try to be as trans I, I try to be as transparent as possible. So I do. Every day, um, I do a weekly video to all of our associates. I go through our metrics. I go through what's going on. We had a situation not too long ago where someone was stealing uh, and, uh, from us, and we had to uh, talk about that publicly. Um, and so being visible, even though we're in this you know virtual world and I've got plants you know at, at m- many different locations, um, it is critical. And, and every day our system is built, our enterprise operating system is built, our, our execution system is built around celebrating our people. And so, you know, we've got a, a an app and um, every meeting opens with good news. And that's not, it's good news about a person. And then when you see that person, you can go, hey, thanks, Frank. I know you did this. And when people know you care, there isn't anything that they won't do for you. And when they know it's genuine and they see um, then they will, they will walk, you know, do whatever the team needs. So we do a quarterly ENPS survey, every associate. I'm really proud of the fact that over 90% of our people, um, participate. And to me, that says they know we're listening because they wouldn't take the time to do it. And we can drill down and figure out, okay, we've got a problem over here. What's going on? How do we support this person? How do we support this function? How do we support this team? And, um, you know, it's one of our core metrics. I mean, enterprise metrics. How are we doing on EMPS? And, you know, we've reported to the board and the stockholders also, uh, you know, it's a key metric for them. They want to know that we have a company where people want to come to work. Um, so it is diligence. It's communicating. It's over communicating. And then it's over communicating again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I kind of feel like, a, you know, the Rolling Stones every night with the same set list. I'm like, Oh, but then you see that associate and they go, Oh, now I get it. And you're like, okay, I'll say it a 10th time. Yeah. I, I saw, I I saw a joke that I said, I'll know that I've said it enough when you start making fun of me for saying it. So that, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. that, 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 you have to, I mean, you have 800 people because you know, some people haven't been there long enough. They've only heard it eight times, not 16 times. And they're not going to have learned, you know, picked up on it yet. Or they've only heard it three times because they're brand new or one time even. And so, and, and, you know, you also know when you hear your people saying it because that you're saying it, it becomes the language of accountability in the organization. So I love that. Do you guys do, um, Q12? Are you familiar with that, that tool Gallup's Q12? You should check that out. I, I actually okay. think it's it's my favorite tool for client for for um, for employee engagement. ENPS sends the, it is kind of volatile, 
Um, so you get okay. some, some pretty I'll wide. Yeah, Q Q12, Q12 is less volatile and it's more around like is the direct manager doing their job. So listeners, go check out Gallup's Q12. ENPS is a great tool too. It's Bain, Bain, Bain Consulting uses that tool. Um, those are my two favorite. I I, I cross reference those tools against each other when I'm when I'm uh, doing my quarterly assessments of of uh, organizations. All right. So uh, well, Trish. Trisha, I'm so excited to have had you on the show. I wanted to end with our greatness question. Um, so, but before we go there, I just want to thank you so much. Like you, this has been so informative. I'm so excited for your um, success and upcoming success with Milo's Tea. You guys have done something really magical and it's just really cool to get to learn more about you and your business. So thank you so much for coming on the show today and uh, sharing all your, all your wisdom and all your story with us. Appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to go to the greatness question. And then um, if you don't mind, I'd love for you to kind of give our audience uh, where they can get your tea. Um, so the greatness question is this. What is the number one barrier to creating greatness that you've overcome in your life? And how did you overcome it? Okay. Wow. My greatest barrier has been um, to believe in, in the impossible to believe that there are no limits, that there is nothing that can hold hold me or the team back if if we really invest in, in one another and 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 keep uh, keep her head down, do the work. Um, I think I said it earlier. You know, we're we're a plow horse, not a show pony, and uh, we got our head down, and we're going to keep pressing on um, because we're we're in this for generations. So, thank you so much for having me. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Um, I would love for your um, your listeners that have not tried Milo's to check us out. We are available in the refrigerated case of uh, most major retailers in, in America. I'm really proud of the fact that we uh, we excel in retailers, you know, like Walmart and Whole Foods. Um, there are not many brands that uh, or any that I know of that can can do that, and that really is a testament to the breadth of uh, our consumer and the quality of our product. So. Um, if you do try Milo's, please uh, let me know. I'm on LinkedIn and I uh, would love to hear from from the first sip face. I love that. Trisha, thank you so much for coming on the show. Everybody go to drinkmilos.com. Check out Milo's Tea Company uh, wherever uh, the brand is sold, which sounds like it's everywhere. And uh, check out Trisha. We're, we'll put her uh, LinkedIn profile in the show notes as well as the uh, link for her website. And the name of the company again is Milo's Tea Company. Trisha, so much gratitude having you here at the Greatness Machine. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, until next time, everybody, peace out. We love you. You are listening to The Greatness Machine, and that's a wrap for today. Listen, if you love what you heard, subscribe to the show on whatever podcast platform that you're tuning in on so that you don't miss any of our future episodes. We have tons of great people coming on, and we're, we're stoked to have you here to enjoy it with us. Leave us a review. Tell us what you love most about this particular episode. We love getting the reviews. We love to see what you guys love most. And if this particular episode you know, made you think of someone who's leveling up in their business and in their life, print screen, share it with them. Leaders are the best givers. And after all, we're all here to support and grow with each other. And in case you want to see some of the fun behind the scenes shots or some of the things that we're doing, I'm actually writing about this in my weekly newsletter. Go to www.therealdarius.com and subscribe to my newsletter. We're talking about fun things like business and life and mindfulness and cryptocurrencies and gosh, I don't even know everything and anything, but it's tons of fun stuff I write about. I try to get it out on a weekly basis. You can subscribe at www.therealdarius.com. And with that said, look, thank you guys so much. I appreciate you. I love you. Peace. We're out of here. See you guys on the next one. Uh-huh. She's my lover.